Uh, good afternoon or good night, close to say good night. So thank you everybody for uh, doing this bit of a physical exercise from the, con for the conference center here to the Academy of Science, but uh, I am really keen to uh, willing, using more American expression, uh, to, uh, to have this special lecture here. This is uh, the Academy of Science of Bologna one of the oldest academies in uh, in Italy actually is the oldest one even though there is a lince in Rome but you know whatever is in Rome is more important you know Rome Rome is Rome and we cannot do nothing you know uh, just if you allow me uh, a bit of a joke uh, I was talking with some guys in Rome and uh, saying okay you from Bologna you're from Bologna, the, the, the city of Tortellini and Lasagna, I say, oh, yes, but it's also a great city, you know, there's a lot of culture, a lot of uh, uh, of masterpieces, and uh, the, the, Roman, the Roman told me, uh, look, but when we were the capital of the world, you, Bologna, you were just a small village, a remote village in the, in the, in the mist, that's it. Anyway, uh, this, this academy uh, started uh, in uh, 16, 1690, and the name was the Academy of Unquiet People, because they were, you know, unquiet in terms of unquiet brain, you know, just trying to, to, to seek new things. Then it was finally established in, nine, in 1711. Uh, but I don't want to spend that much time. This room is actually fantastic. This room and uh, the other one, the one close by, because the ceiling uh, may, uh, are the frescoes from uh, a guy who is called, the name is Tibaldi. This name for you is nothing, but Tibaldi, he was a colleague of another guy that you probably know better, Michelangelo. So uh, this is what he represented here, the, uh, the, 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 this, the diff different various scenes of the, uh, of the trip, of Ulysses' trip back after the, the Troy War back home. Uh, so the academy in Bologna was actually the, uh, the very site of research. Uh, the research was here. Galvani was here. We have had a number also of outstanding members of the, of the society. Even Albert Einstein has been elected member of this society. And uh, uh, unfortunately for the society, I'm acting right now as the so-called perpetual secretary of the society, you know, trying to, to maintain it in a, in, a good, in a good shape. But it's mainly uh, because of the work of uh, our presidents and mainly of the presidents we, president we have now, uh, is a friend of us, is a physician, uh, Luigi Bolondi, and I bring uh, his welcome address in spite of him because he has now other commitments related to his job. Not not job as a president, but job as a physician. So that's why we are here in the Academy of Sciences. But few words about the special symposium lecture. Special symposium lecture is uh, something that goes back to the first one to 1962, when George Weber asked Sir Hans Kreb to deliver this special lecture in Indianapolis. This one is a picture of the, uh, of the last uh, lecture delivered by uh, Sir Hans Krebs in 1976, and when he was uh, talking about the aspects of regulation of the metamerase of branch chain amino acids. It was great. Great, 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 great moment uh, for the uh, for for all those meetings when Krebs was delivering that. But uh, after him, we have had other. Okay, this is just to remind when we celebrated the fifth uh, symposium here in Bologna in uh, 2009, and uh, at that time the special lecture was delivered by the guy, this guy here, so. Another sir, Sir Tim Hunt, another Nobel Prize. And, uh, and this is the celebration of the 60th symposium in Bologna in, 2000, in uh, 2019. And that time was another sir. You know, all, all knighted, many of the lecturers have been knighted by the queen, you know, that, that's, uh, that's interesting. And uh, uh, Sir Phil Cohen. 
but this is something that really uh, impresses me all, all the time you know just looking at the the names of those guys that gave the special symposium lectures you know and uh, if you allow me another joke you know there is only one 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 black dot in that you know and when it wasn't <laughs> when someone coming from Bologna and gave the special lecture in Indianapolis anyway so this is the story and uh, uh, every year we are willing to have very 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 outstanding scientists last year was Sarah Spiegel that uh, something that's you know it looks like that the uh, sphingolipid are uh, taking quite a big role you know during the conferences yeah good and uh, John York was there the year before so now, today, we have as a special lecturer, Yusuf Anun, and uh, this lecture uh, will be chaired by Professor Manzori. You already uh, know her, and please, Lucia, I ask you to introduce our lecturers tonight. Thank you, Lucio. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for this uh, privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Yusuf Ani Anun, which was born in Saudi Arabia and received his uh, early education in Beirut at the International College. He earned a Bachelor of Science at the American University of Beirut in 1977, obtaining an MD with distinction in 1981 and completing his internship and the residency in internal medicine. In 1983, Dr. Hanun left Lebanon to take up specialty training at Duke University with a fellowship in hematology and oncology as well as undergoing postdoctoral training in biochemistry. And it was during this time that he made the initial discovery that protein kinase C was inhibited by sphingosine, showing a bioactive effect for a sphingolipid for the first time. And prior to this discovery, sphingolipids had primarily been thought to be inert structural components of cell membranes. In 1998, Dr. Anun moved to the Medical University of South Carolina to be chair of biochemistry and molecular biology and serving as deputy director of the Hollings Cancer Center. And while at Medical University of South Carolina, the center was noted by the National Cancer Institute as NCI designated. And at that time, there were only 60 such designator centers in the United States. In 2012, Dr. Anun was recruited to be director of the Cancer Center and vice dean for cancer medicine at Stony Brook University where he is also co-director of the Kavita and Lalit Val Center for Metabolomics and Imaging, a major program focused on the study of lipids, metabolism, and imaging in cancer biology and therapeutics. Under Hanun's leadership, cancer research and care at Stony Brook has expanded including the establishment of a new department of bioinformatics to use computer technology to collect and analyze biological data. And this culminated in 2019 in the opening of the Medical and Research Translation Facility, which enables scientists and clinicians to work in close proximity to help advance cancer research and rapidly translate basic research findings into new clinical tools and therapies. The success that Dr. Anun has had as a researcher has generated energy and research resources, not only to support his own work, 
but also to increase prestige and potential to all those who worked with him. His contribution to more than 500 scholarly publications has attracted tremendous grant support and recognition. I don't need to speak about his uh, H-index, which is more than uh, 120, but he has been elected to a number of prestigious societies, including the American Society for Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physicians, and is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has received many prestigious awards, among which I will mention only the Oscar Avanti Award for Lipid Research from the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and the prestigious Quaid Prize in Basic Sciences. The contributions of Dr. Anun to sphingolipid research were recognized by a Lifetime Achievement Award at the 16th International Conference on Bioactive Lipids in Cancer, Inflammation and Related Diseases, the first time that it was given as a joint award. As a researcher, mentor, and administrator, Yusuf Anun has spent a lifetime challenging career. His work to advance disease prevention and treatment has already had a tremendous impact, and I am happy to think that is not done yet. So now I'm really happy to ask Dr. Anun to start with his special symposium lecture. Please, Dr. Anun. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manzoli. Thank you, Lucio, for always organizing a wonderful meeting and bringing such high quality scientists and research uh, to each other and to Bologna. Uh, I need to share. So I will talk to you about uh, our work, at least a couple of major projects in the lab that have been ongoing for a very long time. Um, but first, I will start with an introduction, especially for the students, on sphingolipid metabolism and why we think it's exciting, especially for those of you who weren't at Bink's uh, talk ye uh, yesterday. Um, so I will very briefly go over sphingolipid metabolism and some of its key properties. I will then go over two lines of investigation, uh, one on following enzymes and their regulation and function, and the other looking at ceramide and signaling, and then how the two have nicely and serendipitously, some, somewhat serendipitously, merged very recently. This is my disclaimer. I will not be interrupted my, by my artwork broker during the seminar. Anyone who was here in 2018 would know what I'm talking about. Um, so sphingolipids uh, was, was the field, I mean, were discovered um, biochemically by Fudikum, a, a German scientist, physician scientist working in London, who was looking at the chemical composition of the brain and fractionating, doing whatever they could do back then. He came with an insoluble, acid, insoluble fraction uh, um, and he didn't know what the structure was, and he called it sphingosin. Uh, and sphingosin was after the Greek myth, mythologic uh, character uh, of asking travelers uh, the famous sphinx riddle. Um, and our work on it started, that started again semi serendipitously when we were studying protein kinase C uh, with Bob in Bob Bell's lab. Um, and we, I came across a lipid that no one knew about in the lab called sphingosine and tried it and it inhibited PKC. So that got me thinking when I started my lab of what, what do sphingolipids do? Who are they and what do they do? And back then, uh, if I show you um, 
a PubMed search, there was nothing on sphingosine or ceramide uh, in the early 80s. Uh, what drove our initial work was on a simple paradigm that lipids are interesting whenever you find at least one way to become interesting is to find regulated enzymes of lipid metabolism. Because if it's regulated, it's interesting. What, what does regulated mean? It means an enzyme receives an input, works on a substrate, generates a product, and either substrate or product transmits a signal. So in a way, a regulated enzyme is, the, is nature's most concise uh, information transducer. Um, and this paradigm was beautifully worked out over decades uh, with the uh, G-protein coupled receptor pathways working on cyclases, cyclic AMP and PKA. Uh, and in parallel, when we were starting our work, a lipid a pathway was emerging with phospholipase C and diacylglycerol and protein kinase C. So we wondered if single lipid metabolism was regulated. And one our first hit was looking, finding that sphingomyelin levels were regulated. Uh, there is a historical anecdote there about we were again serendipitously hit on conditions that let us find sphingomyelin turnover. Um, and that generated ceramide and it happened in response to stimuli. We and many others have now a long list of inducers. This is, doesn't even uh, begin to include everybody. Uh, so that was nice. We hit on regulated enzymes. Uh, but unlike the cyclic AMP pathway uh, of signaling, which kind of was the paradigm of signaling, uh, most lipid-mediated pathways, and especially sphingolipids, are not metabolically isolated. Uh, if you think about it, cyclic AMP in mammals functions primarily to activate PKA in a signaling fashion. Its formation and breakdown are regulated primarily for that purpose. But lip sphingolipids are much more interconnected. Again, if you saw, um, you were at Bing's talk, I don't want to belabor this, but we kind of organize sphingolipid metabolism into modules. The center upper one is the de novo pathway that Bing's talked about that starts with amino acids and fatty acids, condense them all the way to dihydroceramide. Then a double bond is introduced, a key double bond to create ceramide. Ceramide in turn can feed into ceramide phosphate, into acyl ceramide, single going counterclockwise, ceramide phosphate, acyl ceramide, single myelin, glycosingolipid, lipid, uh, and then it can be broken down by uh, ceramidases to make sphingosine, and that's uh, phosphorylated by sphingosine kinase to give us sphingosine phosphate. And then that exit, the pathway, the only exit route for sphingolipid is through the sphingosine phosphate lyase. Um, I'm just it, extracting here just this, this part of the sphingolipid network just to tell you how they are metabolically connected. So one can start with sphingomyelin on the left and with sphingomyelinase get ceramide, and with ceramidase get sphingosine, and with sphingosine kinase get sphingosine phosphate. This little numbers uh, underneath these molecules indicate the relative concentrations in the cell. So for every one molecule of sphingosine phosphate, there are around 30,000 30, molecules of sphingomyelin. Some of that uh, stoichiometry I will come back to use to advantage. And these lipids do different things. There's a lot of work on ceramide and possible targets and functions. Mostly tend to be anti-proliferative, but I'll come to that too. Uh, and sphingosine phosphate does the opposite. And in different models, sphingosine is either pro-apoptotic or uh, causes cell cycle arrest. Um, and this just to introduce these key players going from top to bottom is sphingosine, which is an amino alcohol single alkyl chain. Um, sphingosine phosphate, you add a phosphate, ceramide, you add uh, the acyl chain to the amine, and sphingomyelin, you add the phosphocholine to the ceramide. <clears throat> the, so the first takeaway point is 
these are interconnected pathways. So that raises a number of experimental challenges. The second one is these are compartmentalized. The de novo pathway happens in the ER all the way up to ceramide, which is then transported to the Golgi either by vesicular trafficking or by the transfer protein CERT, it's, which couples it mostly to sphingomyelin synthesis, whereas vesicular trafficking takes us on the extreme right to glycosphingol uh, lipid synthesis. And these are transported to the plasma membrane. There is biochemistry at, of these uh, and, um, molecules at the plasma membrane. There is internalization through the endolysosomal system, and they're broken down stepwise in the lysosome to form ceramide and then sphingosine. And sphingosine seems to be the only molecule able to uh, flip-flop across the lysosome. But uh, although the, the, grade, the electro, electric gradient favors it in the lysosome, it can be pulled out of the lysosome by sphingosine kinase or ceramide synthase. OK, so, so there is this basic um, synthetic and catabolic pathway. But on top of it, and that came out from the identification of what all the known enzymes of sphingolipid metabolism and finding that many of them exist in distinct families with different genes doing the same action. Here in red are the sphingomyelinases, in blue are the ceramidases, just to show you they can exist in multiple compartments. So we need to think about compartment specific functions. Another complexity that I mentioned, but I will not be referring to today, is that ceramide itself and sphingolipid in general are very complex uh, from a structural point of view. So in our calculations, there are at least 200 uh, um, measurable ceramides in the cell that differ in the acyl chain, hydroxylations, double bonds, uh, and length of the sphingoid backbone. Um, and that carries through to all the other complex, you know, sphingomyelin, acyl ceramides, and glycosphingolipids. So by at least one estimate, there are tens of thousands of sphingolipids as unique uh, chemical entities. So with that introduction, uh, I can now move to the second part and give you some highlights on neutral sphingomyelinase 2. Uh, when we started, the only enzyme in sphingomyelin metabolism known was acid sphingomyelinase. And as with all new things, the, we were resisted a lot by suggesting there's a neutral enzyme. Um, and But that's what we had found was being regulated, a neutral enzyme. Now we know that there is an extended family of neutral sphingomyelinases, human which include neutral sphingomyelinase 1, which is most likely a lysopath phospholipase C, a neutral sphingomyelinase 2, which I'll talk about, and a mitochondrial neutral sphingomyelinase that we cloned, but we haven't been doing much recently with. Uh, these are related to yeast uh, genes in Cervici ISC1 that we identified and in Pombe CSS1. They're all distantly related to DNAs1 because they carry out an identical biochemical reaction, phosphodiester cleavage. Um, so they have the same catalytic um, foundation. And some bacteria secrete sp neutral sphingomyelinases because they attack mammalian sphingomyelin uh, as part of their virulence. And I'll come to tell you how we've been using these. Uh, so, Neutral sphingomyelinase 2 controls kind of the entry into this part of the connected modules of sphingomyelin going to ceramide. Uh, it was identified in homology to ISC1 from yeast and neutral sphingomyelinase uh, from mammals. Uh, was previously cloned by Hayashi et al. as a confluence arrest, uh, in, in confluence induced uh, arrest gene. Conf Cell, con cell confluence arrest gene, uh, that it was the gene most expressed in a differential uh, screen of differentially expressed uh, genes um, in fibroblasts. Um, we've shown that it is actually a one of feeding sphingomyelinase in cells. It's activated by many things. 
we've shown it's found at the plasma membrane and the Golgi. It's been implicated mostly in Alzheimer's and cancer, and I will refer to some just briefly to that, to the cancer connection. Uh, it, uh, this will be probably my only in vivo slide here. Um, the enzyme localizes to chromosome uh, 16 in close connection with cadherins, and that's a site of frequent less of, uh, loss of heterozygosity in breast cancer. Epigenetically, it's suppressed in many cancers and by many oncogenes. Uh, we showed that in breast cancer, uh, it's activated by reversing those processes. Uh, the knockout uh, mouse has spontaneous liver tumors. And the, the study, the results down here show that it's, it's re-expression into this MDA cells, which have it totally, um, near totally suppressed, uh, cuts down growth in vivo and also prevents metastasis left and right, respectively, um, in a mouse model. So... This enzyme, over the years, we and others have learned it's highly regulated. It's regulated by phosphorylation. It's regulated a lot by induction of gene expression, epigenetic mechanisms, as well as in response to p53 uh, induction. We showed it's palmitoylated, and we showed it's allosterically regulated by anionic phospholipids, especially phosphatidyl serine. <clears throat> And this is kind of the first cartoon of how we think it's organized. Uh, it's mostly an inner plasma membrane protein. It's palmitoylated. It has two hydrophobic loops, HS1 and 2. Uh, it has two palmitoylation sites. And the catalytic part, I'll come back to that in another slide. Um, so this is the crystal structure that Mike Erola identified. Um, and as I always say, it took him three years to purify and crystallize. Now you can input the, the name on uh, alpha fold and get it in three seconds. Um, but at least we have purified protein. Um, okay, so Pradnya Shambog also did um, uh, some biochemical studies uh, involving uh, deuterium proton exchange and uh, short uh, angle x-ray scattering and mutational analysis uh, to define intraprotein protein interactions in the enzyme. And based on those and the um, structure, we propose the following as a model for the enzyme activation. It's anchored to the membrane by the palmitoylation site and these hydrophobic segments. Uh, its catalytic site points towards the membrane. It has this juxta, juxta mem membrane domain that when the enzyme is bound by PF, it brings them together, the GX domain and the catalytic domain. And at the same time, it pulls out um, an, auto in, an inhibitory, auto inhibitory uh, aspartate. Uh, so we call that the DK switch. Uh, this is the green loop uh, in the active form that's pulled out and a histidine goes in. Uh, so it becomes catalytically competent. Um, okay. <clears throat> so now I'll move to the third part of my talk where I will spend most of my time. Uh, this is work mostly spearheaded by Danny Canals, who's a junior faculty in our group now. Uh, and it can, it's focused on the function of ceramide in one compartment. Think of it as the low-hanging fruit of studying compartment signaling because it's much easier to manipulate the plasma membrane. So this started many years ago when we found... <coughs> that adding bacterial sphingomyelinase, remember the soluble sphingomyelinase from uh, bacteria, from uh, staph in this case, uh, um, we found, again, a serendipitous path led us to find that it causes rather acute 
uh, and significant profound dephosphorylation of the Ezrin family of uh, proteins. Uh, you can see the Western blot on the left at uh, two minutes, and you can see the immunofluorescence with phospholerm. Upper left panel goes away with bacterial sphingomyelin A, uh, whereas total ezrin is not affected. I'm not over this time case. Time course, it's not anyway. Okay, now a nifty study we did here to kind of start to figure whether it's ceramide or a downstream product. I'm gonna introduce a couple of other guys. Uh, one is sphingomyelin ASD. This is from the brown recluse spider that uses this as part of its toxic toxin acting on tissues, uh, causing acute inflammation by liberating ceramide phosphate. So sphingomyelin ASD cleaves on this side of the phosphate sphingomyelin AC, or what we refer to generically as bacterial sphingomyelin or any neutral sphingomyelin cleaves on the other side of the phosphate. Uh, so that then this NASD releases ceramide phosphate. The other guy to, um, uh, the other enzyme to introduce is bacterial ceramidase, which cleaves the amide a linkage, and that releases ceramide. And uh, sorry, that releases Sphingosine from ceramide. So what we did here was to take the same cells and treat them with either bacterial sphingomyelinase to make ceramide or sphingomyelinase D to make ceramide phosphate. You can look at the Western blot on the right or the uh, confocal in the bottom. Sphingomyelinase C causes ezrin dephosphorylation. D does not. And then on the very right panel, if you add sphingomyelinase D and sphingomyelinase C, and then sphingomyelinase C, sphingomyelinase C no longer works. So because there's no more substrate. So that tells us it's not the loss of serum, uh, sphingomyelin, but or it's ceramide phosphate, but it's ceramide or a downstream metabolite. We've done similar things with ceramidase and other enzymes. So we're like 99% confident it's ceramide and not an obscure metabolite. So now I'm going to take an interlude first to grab some water. Uh, and tell you about an assay that we just developed last year. Uh, I think it's a clever assay, but I also admit we're not very clever because we could have developed it many years earlier. So um, if you take live cells and you either induce the, an internal endogenous sphingomyelinase, or first I would show you by adding bacterial maize, you obviously cleave outer leaflet sphingomyelin to ceramide. Then we fix the cells, and I'll show you why, and add ceramidase, but soluble ceramidase to that, and then you generate sphingosine. I mean, remember the relative amounts of sphingosine and ceramide? So for every molecule of sphingosine, around 100 of ceramide. So you, you hydrolyze 1% of ceramide, which you can't detect. You make twice the amount of sphingosine. We're good on that? Thanks. Thanks. Um, so... Um, I think I can skip this one, focus on this slide. So here we're looking at sphingosine with bacterial sphingomyelinase. There is no effect on sphingosine or on the right, no effect on sphingosine phosphate. Okay, that's very understandable. Uh, you add ceramidase. Actually, what's not very understandable is there's very little sphingosine produced from just normal growing cells and obviously no sphingosine phosphate. Now you add sphingomyelinase, then add the fixed, well, in this case, on the left side, uh, on the dark or gray bar, no fixing, on the red bar, fixing. Um, so smaze, then ceramidase, you get a significant, this is a quite a bit significant sphingosine increase, uh, but much more sphingosine phosphate increase. These are live cells. So what's happening is you make the sphing ceramide from sphingomyelinase, you make the sphingosine from ceramidase. The sphingosine, even quickly, is able to be 
flipped or to the inside, phosphorylated, and create sphingosine phosphate. But that part requires at least one live enzyme, sphingosine kinase. So if you fix the cell, you kill those enzymes, and now you trap all that downstream product in sphingosine. So now we can measure the red guy by adding sphingomyelinase and ceramidase, and it's stoichiometric. For every molecule of sphingomyelin, we hydrolyze one molecule of ceramide and one molecule of sphingosine. Okay, so it's a very powerful assay. Of course, the, the important thing is to be way past uh, catalytic with the use of the ceramidase. Those of you who lived through DGK days would know what I, what I mean. You, you can't use the, the probing enzyme at limiting concentrations. So how sensitive? Uh, on the left is um, both a combined dose and time response of bacterial sphingomyelinase looking at ceramide formation. Forget the single myelin going down. Just look at ceramide. Um, and if you look at one minute at these amounts of bacterial single myelinase, we don't get any significant detection of ceramide on the left side. Uh, and that is just blown up in the middle panel. So our assays in ceramide, I mean, this is maybe particularly not a good one, but will not detect significant changes in the order of a few percent of ceramide. Now look at the sphingosine uh, profile, uh, and that starts at zero. So that's a huge signal from hydrolyzing a small amount of single myelin that that's the top on the single myelin. Do I have a pointer? How do I do pointer? Yeah, here. So if you look at single myelin here, this is where the action is happening. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you something. So said there's a sub, uh, yeah. So what we're doing here is we're looking at one pool of ceramide at the plasma membrane. So that's the tip of the iceberg. And, and I think we spent 20 some, 20, 30 years diving and looking at the whole iceberg. Um, so now we need to focus on the tip. Now, to do that, we, ha we have to go back to the future. So going back and to the future. Um, these are early studies from Lena's work on uh, TNF and single myelin turnover. We studied in many cells, and it'd be like a blip. In some cells, that these leukemia cells, the blip was 20% to 25% hydrolysis. So we had confidence in that. Um, this is work on the right side from Natalie Andrew, who worked with uh, Thierry Lavad. Um, she's a perfectionist. She came to the lab for a few months and just got amazing data, but this is data from their lab. Uh, and you could detect TNF-induced single myelin turnover very tight numbers. Most people just don't achieve that level of uh, accuracy. Now we... <laughs> including us, I guess. Uh, looking here at TNF-induced single myelin changes, I mean, this is not a measurable change. Uh, so years ago, again, this is from 2001, when we studied TNF on ceramide, there, you know, there, there was noise and things happening here, but most of the ceramide that was induced quite a bit, five-fold, happened at much later time points, in over hours. And that, unlike the sphingomyelinase-induced ceramide, is inhibited by a molecule called fumanesin B, which inhibits de novo synthesis of ceramide by inhibiting the ceramide synthesis. And that was gone. So we worked a lot on these late ceramide changes. But that's a different story. So now we can look at what TNF does. So this is what TNF does to ceramide in the early phase. And this is recapitulates what I showed you before from 20 years ago. There is the late ceramide accumulation with TNF. Now, let's look at the plasma membrane ceramide. And this is what's happening in this interval, this here. So this is a tremendous signal of plasma membrane ceramide in the first several minutes. I mean, it's uh, uh, coinciding with what we and others had shown that 
30 minutes is like the optimal time of single myelin hydrolysis, but it was always relying on small changes. Uh, and look at the late ceramide, which I told you is de novo synthesis. There's no plasma membrane ceramide at the late time point. A lot of ceramide, no ceramide, total. So basically you can get a lot of ceramide at the plasma membrane and hardly produce a dent in the total ceramide. So, um, so what does this plasma membrane ceramide do? Over the years, we had shown ceramide activate protein phosphatases. People have said it may activate PKC delta and epsilon, uh, kinase suppressor of RAS, although it's not a kinase, uh, RAF1, et cetera. But there's a theme of phosphorylation. So we did the phosphoproteomics a couple of three years ago, and uh, comparing the effects of single myelinase, looking at the effects of single myelinase treatment, low dose of single myelinase, this is in the order of 10 milliunits over two minutes. Um, and the, all the changes in dephosphorylation mapped primarily by ontology studies to either a cell adhesion, cell migration, cytoskeleton, kind of the pink, uh, red, and blue. Uh, so, um, and some endocytos. So this was very unexpected. This had not been appreciated as an important biologic possibility for ceramide. But when we added the bacterial sphingomyelinase at those concentrations, you can, you can mess up the cells if you hydrolyze 50% of the sphingomyelin and start attacking other lipids. This is at limiting concentrations of single myelinase. Uh, there is suppression of, uh, I'm sorry, there is, this is the adhesion here. Yeah, the attached cell. So there is less attached cells uh, with the single myelinase. And when we, this is again here, another experiment, attached cells with single myelinase. And if we add the ceramidase, we partly undo that. The, we can discuss later why we don't totally undo it, but there's a biochemical explanation for that. Um, so, um, so that tells us, again, we need the ceramide, and more importantly, we don't need the sphingosine or sphingosine phosphate. <clears throat> and uh, again, th this is looking at uh, now migration. This is random migration in the red box uh, with untreated and treated different cells and followed over time, and there's a lot of migration with single myelinase. So we come to this next question of which endogenous enzyme of single lipid metabolism, which ones regulate plasma membrane ceramide? There are obvious candidates, starting with the ones we see at the plasma we and others see, which include um, um, I'll come back to that next slide. This just to, again, emphasize this point, and this point kind of contradicts the iceberg theory. So uh, this shows that there's no correlation between total ceramide measured in the cell and what's at the plasma membrane. That's the first point. This is total ceramide, and this is plasma membrane ceramide. And then this is the correlation. There's no correlation if you plot them. Most cells, the other take-home point is most cells, like this, have hardly any ceramide at the plasma membrane, which is interesting, especially for people who hypothesize about drafts mediated by ceramide, etc. Most cells have hardly any ceramide exposed. Um, and it's like for the first one, for the HeLa cells, it's like one less than one in a thousand of the ceramide is at the plasma membrane. Now, when you come to this HD29, it's, for us, it's an outlier, and it's around, starts to push around 8 9% of total ceramide. Uh, now, we looked at the, the suspects, the key suspects. These are the two single myelinases, SMPD1 and SMP, which is acid single myelinase. I'm sorry, I'm using the gene names here. And SMPD3, which is neutral single myelinase 2. Uh, new, 
So neutral sphingomyelinase 2 and neutral ceramidase are known and appreciated to be at the plasma membrane and kind of proven. Uh, acid sphingomyelinase and acid ceramidase are postulated as far as I'm concerned. It's still a postulate that whether they really are at the plasma membrane or get to the plasma membrane or work on it. Um, and sphingomyelin synthase is responsible for synthesis of sphingomyelin at the plasma membrane. So um, they show no, none of them shows any correlation with total ceramide. So this is kind of like a control. But when we look at plasma membrane ceramide, these guys don't show any correlation except neutral sphingomyelinase 2, which is a really amazing correlation. And this is uh, the same data, but without the last point. Just if you think that's skewing the line, but it's not. Um, so at this point, sphingomyelinase 3, uh, sorry, 2, SMPD3, seems to be a key regulator of plasma membrane. Well, is a candidate as a key regulator. So um, I don't need that. Um, now, Next, we looked at other sphingomyelinases. There's neutral sphingomyelinase 1 and uh, neutral sphingomyelinase 3. And uh, they're, A, they're not at the plasma membrane, and B, they don't cause plasma membrane ceramide, unlike neutral sphingomyelinase T, 2, i.e. SMPD3. <clears throat> now, we overexpressed neutral sphingomyelinase 2. And by the way, these are all unpublished data. Uh, overexpressed neutral sphingomyelinase 2 in various cells, and it uniformly increases plasma membrane ceramide. And we downregulated in that cell line, the HD29, with a very high uh, kind of basal plasma membrane ceramide. And if we downregulate neutral sphingomyelinase 2, uh, we lose that. Um, we lose that um, ceramide. Uh, and moreover, if we express neutral sphingomyelinase 2 in cells that have very low plasma membrane ceramide, we mimic the action of exogenous sphingomyelinase, which is uh, to decrease adhesion and increase migration by you know, wound healing, less, less unhealed area, indicating more migration. And this is random migration in the bottom. Um, OK. I think I'm okay, good time. I have 10 minutes. Uh, so <clears throat> we had shown many years ago, and others had also connected doxorubicin to sphingolipid. But we had shown that it induces specifically neutral sphingomyelinase 2. And th this is a remarkable induction. This is the basal level here. Again, in many cancers, as I said, it's heavily epigenetically suppressed. It gets induced quite a bit um, at the protein level, message level here, and activity level. Uh, if we do that, if we treat cells with doxorubicin, we get here. If, yeah. So this is the signal of plasma membrane ceramide, doxorubicin. Vorinostat, which undoes epigenetic suppression, also induces that um, ceramide at the plasma membrane. And if we look at cell adhesion, there is much less adhesion with doxorubicin or vorinostat. And these go away with knockdown of sphingomyelinase or inhibition of sphingomyelinase. Reciprocally here, if we look at migration, there is much more migration. Um, I should have mentioned that. Doxorubicin induces neutral sphingomyelinase at what we call sublethal concentrations. So it's an interesting connection. Uh, maybe I should go back to convince you. Um, if you look here, lethality starts to occur at one micromolar onward, and it doesn't induce the, the enzyme appreciably. So it's a sublethal effect of doxorubicin. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, here, back here. So at these concentrations, actually, it's, it's important for clinician. Doxorubicin may be not a great player because it increases migration. Um, but that's dependent on sphingomyelinase and GW, um, which is the inhibitor of sphingomyelinase. And likewise, if we add ceramidase, we undo both effects, the effects on adhesion 
and the effects on a migration. So this is the last part of my talk. I want to reintroduce protein phosphatases. And again, this is uh, involves something very old. Uh, we worked on phosphatases more than 30 years ago. It was a simple, simply, simplistically driven uh, fishing expedition. We looked at effects of ceramide on some known kinases, got nothing. As soon as we started implicating ceramide in biologies that look opposite to what kinases do, we said, does it regulate phosphatases? And it does in vitro. Um, um, this is stimulation of uh, during purification of cell proteins and looking at phosphatase activity, and we trace that to both PP2 and PP1. Uh, and that was also validated in yeast um, by Nichols and Broach initially, uh, by sorry, by us first, by Julie Saba, back then Fishbein, and uh, then Nichols and Broach identified the subunits of ceramide-activated phosphatase. So in the Ezrin studies, we had shown that the dephosphorylation of Ezrin, this is, remember, acute, two minutes, was dependent on PP2, PP1 alpha. So if we knock, this is treatment with bacterial sphingomyelinase throughout here. Uh, um, so this is the dephosphorylated ezrin, only knockdown of PP1 alpha, either by itself or in combination with other phosphatases, reverses the effect of bacterial sphingomyelinase. And this is using here a dominant negative. Sorry, I need my glasses. A, a dominant negative form of PP1 alpha, and this is controlled phosphoezrin. This is with overexpression of PP1, we we lose with bacterial maze, we lose. If we put dominant negative PP1, we restore um, basal phosphorylation of Ezrin. <clears throat> so what's the role of this ceramide activated phosphatase in mediating the acute responses to PM ceramide? We did another phosphoproteomics and came up with a lot of dephosphorylated proteins, some phosphorylated, even within uh, two minutes. So it was kind of remarkable. Um, and I, I would say around 20% of total dephosphorylations were dependent on PP1 alpha. There are others that are dependent on PP2A and some on gamma. Um, and if we just focus here, this is adhesion. Uh, which is suppressed by bacterial sphingomyelinase. All the dashed have bacterial sphingomyelinase. Uh, knockdown of PP1 beta or PP1 gamma does not affect this response. Knockdown of alpha reverts. So PP1 alpha is the key phosphatase, and we're working now on its acute translocation within that time frame to the plasma membrane, and it does translocate. Um, it's also here just to show you that it's also required for the doxorubicin, although this takes hours of treatment with doxorubicin. Still, the effects on uh, adhesion, this is the effect of doxorubicin on adhesion, reverted by knockdown of PP1. Effects on migration, reverted by knockdown of PP1. So this is my last scheme for uh, the talk. Um, just trying to simplify it here. We started probing these pathways with bacterial sphingomyelinase, but now we're uh, re reverting to doxorubicin as an inducer of levels of sphingomyelinase and TNF as an acute activator. These produce plasma membrane ceramide, which is involved in ezrin dephosphorylation through PP1. Um, not showing you here, what also makes it very interesting is if sphingosine, once it's converted to sphingosine, sphingosine phosphate, it actually reverts the, reverses the process. So the sequential action of ceramide dephosphorylates, then sphingosine phosphate phosphorylates. And we've published on that phosphorylation. So in conclusion, uh, I 
went over sphingolipid metabolism and told you it generates a number of neat molecules, um, but it's a network and we have to dissect the network. I gave you some, some experiments to show you how we can start dissecting those. Uh, and compartmentalization. At this point, we're focusing on the plasma membrane. Our other ongoing target is the Golgi. Uh, so stay, stay tuned on that. Um, neutral sphingomyelinase 2 is a key enzyme, and it's the, it's the key sphingomyelinase that's regulated by most inducers and stimuli. And then the acute signaling in the plasma membrane. Um, so plasma membrane ceramide exerts acute effects on protein phosphorylation, causing mostly dephosphorylation. It's regulated by neutral sphingomyelinase. Uh, it has roles in cell migration, and those are mediated by PP1C alpha. Uh, these are the many co-workers in the, labs who, in the lab who work on this. Um, the work I showed today uh, on neutral sphingomyelinase, uh, some with Andrew Resnick, uh, and Kalai Iowa, uh, and uh, major collaboration now with Danny Kanaz, who's setting up shop on his own. Um, and this is the ceramide group. Uh, the alkyl chain is in front, and the acyl chain is on the stairs. Um, and I thank you for your attention. The discussion is open, so uh, if there are any questions? Please. Good. Okay. Um, yeah. Beautiful work, of course. Um, so, Yusuf, tell me about the dynamics, especially with with the doxorubicin. Is is it constitutively up for hours? Is the ceramide up in the plasma membrane for hours now that you have this beautiful system for measuring, you know, very specifically these really relatively small amounts of ceramide in, in the plasma membrane, you have the ability to see whether it goes up and down. And maybe you could talk about what the uh, swing myelin synthase of the plasma membrane does to regulate the signal. I think we're just scratching the surface of how to study that. And I think in a way, because I started my career with diacylglycerol and PKC, I think PKC was the curse for diacylglycerol because no one bothers to look at diacylglycerol. They jump on PKC, right? So they, they don't look at, I don't think anyone has done something similar for diacylglycerol. So we don't know much about how to dissect these things. What I can tell you about the plasma membrane ceramide is A, uh, you can reset it. Once you turn on sphingomyelinase, like with doxorubicin, which takes hours. I mean, doxorubicin induces the gene it takes hours, 12 hours, et cetera, goes up, I don't know, the gene, 50-fold. Uh, the expression goes up 50-fold. Uh, plasma membrane ceramide goes up 10-fold, and it stays during that duration. Now, um, so far, we're not aware of mechanisms that acutely clear that ceramide. When we look, and I didn't show you those, there's still preliminary data. Like for example, neutral ceramides is able to clear that ceramide, but it's ours. So um, I suspect, just like, like John would like to suspect that there are more regulated mechanisms that can deal with the making it up and down. Now what's interesting about single myelin synthase, see it's all this for me is back to the future thing. Um, many, many years ago, Chiara Luberto found that some oncogenes drive rapid resynthesis of sphingomyelin at the plasma membrane. Uh, and we stopped there because we didn't know how, we didn't even have the genes, right? So, but now it's obviously it's sphingomyelin, it's sphingomyelin synthase two, not one. Uh, and so it can be regulated, but that's again, goes from like, instead of six to 12 hours to reset the sphingomyelin, it goes to maybe half to three hours. So it's not very acute. Is, is one of the ceramidases capable of acutely clearing that? I don't know. What sets that, you know, you saw the different cell lines. What sets every cell line to have its, what looks like steady state level of plasma membrane sound, we don't know. Um, 
So lots of open questions on that metabolism. Yes, Vitas. So, so Yusuf, um, now that you have these acute ways to perturb uh, uh, sphingomyelin levels and then, and then uh, you know, ceramide as well, have you looked at cholesterol? What happens to cholesterol at, at this uh, uh, with these treatments? Well, now that Binks wants to look at it, we will look. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we, um, as you may know, the, the literature on that is all over, literally all over the place. Uh, and I think one key thing is people have abused this sphingomyelinase treatment because they use it at 100 and 300. I've seen some people use it at 1,000 milliunits per mil, which not only cleaves every single molecule of sphingomyelin, but starts cleaving PC and other lipids. So I, yes, it should be revisited. And if Binks wants to use this, I mean, you don't need the technology, you just need the conditions of using the sphingomyelinase. I think it should be done by all means. Laxorubicin is, because it takes hours, it's dirty. TNF would be much nicer, actually, because it's much more acute. But the bacterial maze is the most surgical, because you're, you're going, starting with that. And uh, Ray. Uh, I'm curious if you could just speculate on how you think some component of the, the, the is it sing, single myelinase two that's in the nucleus um, that might be detecting the DNA damage? There's that thing from Sarah Spiegel, it's sphingosine kinase two regulates HDAX. I don't know if you remember that paper, but it's, yeah. and that's obviously not this, but do, can you speculate about yeah, any, yeah, yeah. how that's the DNA damage? Speculate. So, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I took a whole chunk results on the nuclear sphingomyelin. It's the same enzyme that can be found in the nucleus. And now we can see it for the first time. So um, it's a different biology there. Uh, it has nuclear effects. Um, it's kind of outside currently my uh, knowledge kind of comfort zone. Uh, but our biggest hit as a regulator of that is RAD21. Uh, so we're, we're trying to figure out what it does. In, in, in yeast, we've published on nuclear, the ISC1, uh, and there it's involved in a, a chromatid separation in the, in the sister chromatid separation checkpoint. Uh, but Again, we haven't followed that much more. Uh, I think it's fascinating, but we also have suggestions of how single myelinase can get to two different places. I think you, well, that was very interesting. I think you partially answered already, but my question was related to the uh, phosphoproteomic analysis if you found components of recycling endosomes yes. that should be associated to, to migration somehow. So that, that was, oh. you, you already mentioned RAP21 that I think is one of the proteins not that are related. No, not RAP, that's RAD. Yeah. Uh, so um, the first part, yes, we found a lot of endocytic targets for yeah. uh, phosphor dephosphorylation. Um, so you think that ceramide accumulation at the membrane will favor endosomal recycling? Recycling, pa very possible. Actually, there's been uh, one publication from someone at Hopkins uh, then years ago, um, adding bacterial single myelinase and showing ATP independent endocytosis. Mm -hmm. But again, it's very old stuff. Yeah, I don't think many people have followed up on that. Okay. I mean, there, there are lots of possibilities. Yeah, thanks. And please, Nal. I just a quick one. I might have missed it. Um, what's the link um, through the activation of TNF? So, what's the pathway? 
how's TNF uh, leading to the production here? Do you, do you know what, what's doing that? No, we, I mean, we have preliminary data. Uh, I think like Vitas, I'd probably be assassinated if I reveal those. But, you know, one reason I hope the students realize a couple of things going on. One is it may take 30 years to begin to resolve a problem. I mean, this is how things are. Uh, number two is, you know, we went where we could understand things. And in the, with the small changes that DNF was doing to total ceramide and single myelin, we did not invest in those um, mechanisms. Now we, we have a readout, you know, we can take to the bank. We can now, and we are probing those mechanisms. And, and it's a finite universe from TNF I mean, over 15 to 30 minutes. It's a very finite signaling universe uh, from TNF. Other questions? No question. So my question was about the nucleus, but uh, yes, but maybe we can conclude and please uh, uh, let me spend few seconds just to give a personal thank to Dr. Anun uh, for being here, but uh, not only for this uh, wonderful talk, but also for the outstanding career, also uh, for his contribution to the innovation of the methodology of research, and especially for his commitment to supporting young people. And I think maybe the better way to conclude this meeting is to mention what Dr. Anun said about the over 60 PhD and postdoc students he has supported and advised during these years. The better you mentor students and postdocs, the best research you get to do. Thank you very much, one, Dr. One Anu. of my ex visitors is right here. Yes. Grazie. Good. So, all right. Here we are. So, before ending the, this, this symposium, the 64th, I want to thank all the speakers because you did a a wonderful job and i also want to thank the chairman that they were capable to keep on time every session but that's a very important very important issue and uh, then i want to thank the three angels that gave us a, a very good hand you know <laughs> you know that that's actually it could be a fourth one uh it's Stefano, but uh, he's trying to grow, you know, with the big air like an angel, but it's not, not that close. Eh? <laughs> anyway, let me uh, thanks all the people of the lab and uh, that they supported me in research, and, but also in the organization of this symposium since 2005. So it's quite, quite, quite a long, uh, a long time. So I want to thank my wife supporting me all the time and uh, uh, supporting and standing me all the time, which is not not that easy. I'm not an easy man. I mean, you know, sometimes they say I'm a, a, a sort of a, a salt and potato man and things, but no, not at all. I'm quite difficult. And thanks to my wife and my two daughters that, okay, I, I, fortunately, I have this meeting uh, every year because it's the good occasion when I, I see both of them all together. So. <laughs> But uh, I'm not joking. It's a reality, you know. You know, I say that my two old ducks they they appear only sometimes. Anyway, uh, I have to thank who is supporting us. I have to thank Elsevier for the publication of the series, the journal, and also for the financial support, and as well as the uh, Fondazione is a private foundation here in Bologna that they are supporting us and they give us the possibility to to run this meeting so let me finish with this you know is a joke from uh, 
from, from Julia from the, the lab, Professor Esther Ramazzotti, and uh, I want to be green. And okay, please leave your badge in the box at the exit of the restaurant after dinner, because you know everything will end with the dinner, and we are getting greener and greener and greener. So we save the 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 the, the plastic. You can keep the card, but you know just <laughs> okay. Thank you again, and we'll reconvene half past seven uh, at the uh, hotel restaurant. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. <laughs>